Good evening to uh, everyone that's here this evening. I think this is a, a proud one when we look at uh, what this milestone year is for SFU, uh, 50th anniversary. And these are powerful opening remarks we hear right off the top of five years ago, a $22 million donation is made by the Beattie family. And if we look behind us, you see it. Yeah. Beattie School of Business, when you see it, when you hear it, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about the impact of this uh, for this school and for the students? I think the word that comes to mind, and it happens probably every two or three days, is, is disbelief. You know, you're reading the paper and there's Beattie engaged and there's a photo of an amazing student describing what they've done. And, you know, I, I pause and, and reflect, even though it's been five years, it, I guess it takes a while to sink in, but it's, it, the, the feeling is absolutely um, wonderful. Uh, and it, 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 you know, pays emotional dividends, you know, on, on a daily basis that, that I, I think we're so fortunate to be in a position to make the gift and to have it so well received and then to see the impact it's had on, on students is, uh, it's profound, it's very humbling. And um, uh, I think like I've said before, it's the best thing that I've ever done in my uh, professional career by far. One of the motivating factors f moving forward and what, why we love to make money and build things and do all this is that we can contribute back in more and in bigger ways. And I've got all sorts of ideas what I want to do uh, in the future because you know, the, the more you give, the greater it feels. Well, you're leading by example with the idea of philanthropy and hopefully convincing others that may not give as much when they're in the position to do it. Your journey is an interesting one going back to 2001. At the age of, what, 32, hmm. you become president of the BD Development Group. 15 years as president, you've probably faced many highs and lows, uh, but this idea of just basic business principle, for anybody watching this right now, what do you say are the three core values of how you do business that's allowed you to grow your business exponentially? Um, I think there are so many that I can list, but if I want to narrow it down to three, I'd say uh, dependability being one that we're true to our word. If we say we're going to do something, we do it, period. Like that's our commitment and we always follow through and that's uh, a value that's been um, instilled in me by my parents from a very young age and I think my dad always said like if you tell me something you better be you better be 100% sure because I, I've got to be able to count on your word. I think loyalty plays a huge role in it. We have uh, been fortunate to have many long-term employees. We measure their tenure in decades and not years. Just last week we had two uh, people retire, one at 46 years and one at 30 years. And, and that this is a, uncommon in, in the development industry. I'm sure there's other great companies that have long-standing employees, but we've had two at over 50 years. Um, so we measure the relationships in extended periods of time. It's not just about this quarter or this year. It's, it's about in the next 10 years and 20 years and what are people going to say about us. The reputation is, is everything. Um, and I would, the last one I think would be you know, being, being honorable. Um, it relates back to, to the, the first one, but, but when our, our name is on a, on a building, it's almost a bit of a, like a lifetime guarantee. You know, we don't really put that on ready, but our name is, is, you know, is behind it. If there's something that's wrong, we're gonna, that's a structural inherent problem with the building, we're gonna be there to stand by it. And I've told the story a few times. We determined a few years ago that some buildings we had constructed in 1992, 1993, um, the structural engineer had made some mistakes and the buildings actually weren't designed to the code at the time. They used the wrong zone or something. And of course, the standards today are much different. We didn't have any kind of legal obligation to go back and fix these buildings. But, you know, we've got 20 buildings that have this potential structural issue. We didn't hesitate. We have to, we're going to go back. Talk, we, own, we own half the buildings still, but 10 of them are owned by others. You know, we go and meet the, the owners, tell them what we want to do, and we go in and, and repair them. And, and people are so, wow, like 20 years later, you come back and do this. But that's, that's who we are. We, we do the right thing. So it's this constant vision of down the road as opposed to the here and, and now. So I think those would be the, the three. I'm sure there's many more, but those three. Well, those mind. three are key, and you touch on the art of the deal, and I'm sure there are many deals under the umbrella of the BD Development Group with BD Living, BD Industrial, BD Capital Partners. From a business leader standpoint, what's the key question you ask yourself to determine whether any deal is right for you, the family, and the business? 
well, it's got to be profitable for one, or expect to make money, because that's for a business to make money. But that's a, bit of a, that's a bit of a given. I think it depends on the area that we're looking at. But if we focus on, say, on the industrial side, for, for instance, if we look at a project or a building, we think, you know, can we add value? Can we do a good job? Is this a client that we're going to want to work with, um, that we're, you know, we're going to get a good reference at the end of the day? Some people are more difficult than others, and 95% of our clients are great. But we're not going to step into um, a deal or do a project that we think could be acrimonious or if someone's too difficult. Um, to deal with, I think we would look at whether you know, our employees would be excited and engaged in saying, you know, this is something we really want to, uh, to do and, and is it good for the community? I mean, if I think we look at some of the residential projects, uh, especially ones like in Coquitlam, we've got one with the um, YWCA as partners, we look at sort of community benefit. And so there's a variety of, uh, of areas that we look at, but you know, it's got to be fun, right? We want to do things that are fun. We've been uh, at this for a long time, and we're not going to enter into an agreement or do a deal that doesn't pay off um, in emotional dividends, and, as, as well as financial, of course. It's got to, it's got to make that uh, pass that test. Full disclosure, Ryan and I had the chance to sit down last week and cover off some of the key points for this dialogue tonight. And one of the things that stood out that you said is, what you do is not who you are. And when I think about the idea of your identity shifting, you mentioned the transition. You become president of the BD Development Group. Why did you want to do it, and what do you love about leading this organization? Oh, my gosh. I've, I've loved, I, I think, since growing up in, in this household where on Sundays you go for Sunday drives with your mom and dad, and instead of going to the park or walking the dog, we're looking at buildings. So, <laughs> and, and you're on a construction site, and you're seeing what's going on, and, and you know, you, you're young and impressionable, and you're seeing that, your father is responsible for these massive buildings being constructed and it's really exciting it's dynamic you know at the end of the day when you do a project you've got a tangible result a physical um, building you can look at you've got hopefully happy clients you're leaving it sort of this mark um, on the landscape and so at, at a young age that was something that inspired me and I think also you know we all want to make our parents proud and here's this you know, significant company that um, your father's built up, and there's an opportunity to, to get involved and take that to the next level. It's been it's been a wonderful um, journey, but I I love the process of you know buying land, doing a deal with it. I, my role has changed, by the way. I used to be dealing with clients all the time, land acquisition. That was a lot of fun. I actually enjoyed it a little more than my role now. To be candid with you, I mean, I've got a lot of different responsibility, and it's great. But there was nothing more. Um, satisfying that meeting with a client promising that you're going to deliver something and then they sign it's that vote of confidence that they're they, they trust me they trust us to deliver on the promise to them it's something that we take very seriously what impresses you most about someone the first time you meet them um, if they're uh, I, I thrive on energy I love energetic passionate exciting people and and that they're buzzed about what they're doing they're jazzed and they're talking really fast and whatever and, and I, I need that my brain needs a lot of stimulation so I think when people are excited and how am I doing so far you're doing, doing fantastic okay? <laughs> you're doing fantastic it, it's it's a it's a bit of an issue because it's always sort of buzzing and whatever but I find myself um, especially certain employees that work for the company when I'm around them and, and they're just completely jazzed with what they're doing and that energy is contagious and it gets me all fired up and then other people get fired up so that that is um, when, when there's this passion and energy um, when people uh, have an urgency about them they're, they're just not waiting around that there's there's an, a bit of a in, in, impatience I'm a bit of an impatient person myself especially when I uh, drive but the people <laughs> um, people there's that impatience and that 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 gusto I love that and when there's uh you know, it's used a lot, and it's you know, maybe overused, but just challenging the status quo, challenging the way things are done instead of, you know, we've always done it that way. I think we always, all of us, need to reassess what we do day to day because we can fall into the trap of the routine, and there needs to be fresh thinking and fresh challenging and creating an environment that fosters that, that where people feel that they can throw out ideas and suggestions, and there's no, no dumb ideas that we're... Um, there's an openness and a willingness to, to share and to learn from each other. I don't want necessarily people that just fit within the mindset of other people because then they're more likely just to go along with what's, what other people are thinking. I want people that are prepared to um, challenge, challenge things and question things and not just be a yes 
a yes person. I think they have to have the values that the company has and that we think we have as, as a family that they're going to be good ambassadors for, for the brand and for us. And if we're putting them in front of someone, that they're going to um, be consistent with that. And they're not going to do anything that's offside of that. They'll be looking out for the interests of the company versus themselves. And again, having that energy and enthusiasm um, to, to carry the name, name forward, I think that's, that's crucial. You know, honesty, integrity, all those things. But it's hard to know. We actually use a, an assessment tool. Um, it's a psychological sort of survey testing thing because people can go through interviews and oftentimes can sell you a bit of a story. But it's nice to know, OK, what's actually underlying that and who are these people really? And do they fit within the organization from a cultural standpoint? One of the things that stands out uh, about your presence is the idea of vulnerability. You said you wanted this to be candid. You said you wanted this to be open. And I think uh, interviewing people on a daily basis, the thing you learn is that everyone you meet is fighting a, a battle of some sort that you know nothing about when you first meet them. This idea of insecurities and the ability to manage insecurities, I think, is what effective leaders do well. Mm. Outside looking in, life is good. You're the guy. You've got the name on the business school. You're giving back to the community. Yeah. But at the core, what do you struggle with on a daily basis when it comes to work? When it comes to work, I thought, or can I, can I open that up to everything? You want Let's me to go be life. Up? Let's go life. No, we'll go life. No, no. Um, uh, I think I drink a little bit too much wine. I think that, you know, <laughs> you, know they, they, you read studies about people, and as they get older, they get happier, which in some respects is sort of counterintuitive, but I think. Um, I have far fewer insecurities than I w had when I was younger. Before, I hated public speaking. Now, I don't mind it. It's, that's OK. Um, I, when I was younger, really wanted to differentiate myself from my father. You're, you're coming in, into the business world and, and into the community having this sort of iconic you know, figure as a father, but you want to have your own identity and your own. That motivated, motivated me for a long time to being, am I you know, just the son or my, my own person? I'm well past that now. I think that probably What was changed. the breakout moment for that? that I, I, I think it was winning the Entrepreneur of the Year Awards in 2009. I, I do. I, I think it was a, it's a gradual process, but to me that kind of put an exclamation mark on it, or that's a line where you're going, I'm getting recognition personally from uh, an amazing organization and judges based on what I've done as a leader of this organization. And that validation was very um, heartwarming. That was, that was an important, um, important moment um, for sure. So those are areas uh, I think in the past where I, was in, I have felt insecure. I don't really have many now, but there are moments where um, you know I was lucky enough again this year to attend the, the TED Talks. And you know there are many cases where I'm surrounded by friends and business colleagues and you know I've got my mojo. I know exactly what I'm talking about. And I'm not that I'm the man, but I, I'm feeling like I, I've got this, right? I, I'm totally in control. And I put myself in an environment with a bunch of you know, tech billionaires. And you're looking around the amazing thing, people, and I'm Feeling not that special at that, that, that <laughs> moment, going okay. This is this is uh, humbling, and it sort of brings you to uh, um, you know back to uh, you know I think probably a healthy level. I think too much of an ego is a really bad bad thing. It leads to poor uh, decision making, and it makes you someone who you probably aren't in your in your core. But always willing to learn yeah. is, is is what I'm hearing uh, with what you're saying. Uh, the idea of uncertainty, especially in a market like Vancouver, we know there's impact being made in Alberta. When you look at outlook of investments, of development, how do you manage this as a business, as a leader, the idea of uncertainty and keep your cool under uh, tough times? Um, that's an excellent question. I think one has to suspend their sort of natural human instinct for risk aversion. <laughs> you, know, you think, wow, this could happen, that could happen. To be a real sort of entrepreneur, you have to you know you have to take risk into consideration, but you have to be prepared to uh, I think suspend that natural inclination. The way I look at it is if we're looking at a deal or an acquisition or a piece of property, and I look at a deal and think, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? Like, wait, if this really just did not pan out well, what's the worst thing that can happen? Can we handle that? Would it be a problem? 
you can handle that, then, then you carry on. And that's kind of the conclusion that I've come to over the years. And uh, I think I've been having done, I mean, I've got a relatively, I've got a pretty long career already under my belt um, at 47. I've been doing it so long, you become a little bit more um, immune to it. I know I've got colleagues in the office, we make decisions on acquisition, and they go, are you sure you want to do this? Like, yeah, like, you know, what's the, they're way more worried than, than I am. And um, and I respect that. It's good. It's good to be uh, challenged on, on those uh, on those issues. But I think um, looking at a situation again and saying, okay, what, what's the what's the worst thing can happen? If can we handle it, then then carry on. There you go. And you, you don't have a choice because if you're going to be afraid to make moves like that, you're, you're going to be stagnant. You're not going to grow. And so the odd thing's going to happen that doesn't really work in your favor. You've got to look at the overall scorecard and not just the individual. Five years ago, you made an impact for this university. You say you're 47 now. What do you see in the next five years of causes you want to get behind and impact you want to continue to have, whether it's this university, uh, this city, this, this country? What do yeah. you see? Yeah. Wow. That's a very broad question. We've been so fortunate. Um, in addition to the SFU donation, we've been involved with uh, Ronald McDonald House. Uh, my wife, Cindy, chaired a uh, capital campaign for the Bloom Group, it used to be called um, St. James Society, down, downtown east side, women's shelter. There are so many organizations. I and mean, we make you know, not only a big dollar amount of contributions that you talked about in, in, in total, but there's a, a lot of organizations that we get behind. Um, and it's difficult to decide you know, what to support. Uh, I think for us, um, causes involving children and women and vulnerable women, those really uh, resonate. Part of what we use now, and I think we've put, got a bit more structure around it, which I'm really happy about, is we'll um, make contributions to causes where we can have employee engagement. So at Ronald McDonald House is a good example. We donated $500,000, named the, the kitchens, the BD family kitchens, and our employees go you know, at least once a year to cook dinner for the family. So we're marrying our financial contribution to the engagement of the employees. And we're doing this you know, across the board now, and it's wonderful. And, People just need to be asked to give, and they're more than happy to do it. When we put the word out for um, for the Ronald McDonald House, we had 60 uh, employees sign up within you know an hour. Like we're on it, and it's absolutely wonderful. So organizations where we can make a financial impact, but also um, volunteer and, and put the name behind that that is uh, becoming a, a key driver. But there are so many worthwhile uh, causes. I'm really excited, though, again, for the future. It's a big motivator for me uh, and the organization moving forward that we can do more and more, especially in two and a half years. I'll be 50, and I really want to do something very significant around my 50th birthday. I don't know what that is yet, but I've got some ideas. And when I get in my head, they're hard to get out of. It hits, gets there, and it, it ends up executing. Having these goals and things to look forward to like that, um, it's, uh, it's what life's all about, and we're really really happy about that. The enthusiasm is contagious and I can't help but uh, think it rubs off on not only the co-workers but the BD ambassadors here, at, you know, part of the university and I remember going to university, the organizations I would be a part of and I was at an event last week, a table of BD ambassadors are there and it just makes me think, taking you back to your day, Simon Fraser University, a part of the experience, what are some of your fondest memories when uh, you had pivotal moments defining what you wanted to do, where you were going to go. We spent a lot of time, both Cindy and I, in youth politics back in, uh, you know, 86, 87, 88. I was uh, on the, um, the Student Society Forum as the business rep. I was a senator for a while. I think my motivation was to get a good parking stall, but I did go to the meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and then I won, and then I was, but I wasn't re-elected. Um, uh, so there's all sorts of you know uh, events and organizations that uh, we were involved in, and, and friends to this day that I got an email today from a, a university friend. Were getting involved in these groups and organizations, it leads to lifetime relationships. So I look back on that time very, very fondly, and and, and the students I meet now, like holy smokes, that they're way more engaged. I think generally than the students were back then. They're they're, they're smarter. They're more energetic. I, I get so much. Um, personal inspiration and energy from the students that I uh, get to meet when I go to various BD events. Lifetime relationships is a key word that kind of stands out. Um, that notion right there, whether it's a student, a co-worker, a VP that you work with, what's your approach to, to build key relationships and make every conversation count? I think 
to be to make every conversation count, have these relationships. It comes back to the issue of, of vulnerability, being open and sharing, and not just having sort of surface type conversations. Trying, you know, what is someone feeling? What are the issues? And 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 you know, bury your soul a little bit. I'm very open with my my friends and colleagues. And I'll, an example would be um, at our company Christmas party in December. You know, we announced my dad and I that he has dementia, and you know, that's that's a very personal, private, like you know. Um, significant medical condition and he and I talked about it and I thought well you know if we're sharing this sort of thing with our extended family who, who are our employees um, that's you know, very powerful they're entrusted with this and they feel like they're really part of something more significant which which they are but we didn't hesitate to do that and I think when you are open that way and you're, you're trusting and you share something that leads to an intimacy and a reciprocation that can help create a bond to last a long time. And before we open it up to the floor for questions, because we'd like to encourage the dialogue to continue, for anyone in this room tonight or anyone that may be watching this video after the fact online, from what you've learned in business about succeeding, what's the best piece of advice you've learned? Maybe something your dad Keith taught you or something you've learned as 15, uh, 15 years as president? Uh, I think it comes down to just being honest, being yourself, um, uh, conducting yourself in an in a ethical, consistent, uh, appropriate manner where your company brand or your personal brand is, is just un, unquestionable. Like that when people can rely on what you say, if you're gonna, I'm gonna do this, and you can take it to the bank, and there's a whole bunch of people behind, being employees, tenants, clients, anyone we built for, to say yes, in fact, they are like that. I think reputation is is everything on a personal level and on a company level and thinking the long term. Hi, my name is Grish Samtani. I was just wondering if you could comment a little bit on gut instinct versus more well thought out decision making and how you reconcile the two when they're at odds. Yes, that's excellent. Um, <laughs> you, you hear a lot about this gut instinct just go with your gut and, and I think there's a bit of that but um, Sometimes that can be, I think, a little bit impulsive. I think generally it's really important to, you know, be decisive, make a decision, you know, relatively quickly. I, I, I like to consult with people. I, I may have my own sort of gut instinct, but what does the rest of the, the team think? I, you know, at the end of the day, if it's close, I'll make this decision. We had it the other day um, in, in the company over a like, really an insignificant matter where I was going in one direction. My gut was telling me this, but... I wanted to get the advice and opinion of, of others and, and, and cross-section within the company. And I, I took what everyone said and just reflected on it. I said, you know what, they're actually right and, and, and not me. So um, there's obviously a, a big role for gut instinct and experience and the like, but I, I think it's important to not just go with that. I think, I think you want to solicit the advice of, of other people and you're going to come up with a better um, better answer. I do think it's important to be decisive. We have so many things coming at us all the time. We don't want to dither dather around like I'm not the most patient person. I think you can reconcile those two, consult, but then boom, and carry on. And be be okay with making mistakes. Like in a CEO, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, you want to make more good decisions than poor decisions, but be prepared to accept the, um, the poor ones. I know a lot of friends and, and businesses, and one in particular who just says, well, I go with my gut, and I, I watch some of the decisions he makes, and I'm like, hmm, sometimes that doesn't work out so well. So, um, and he's you know, a great guy. Everyone's got a different, um, a different approach, but um, I think being in an environment where, you're, again, you're open and listening to other people and where, where you create, foster an environment where, especially around the senior management team, I want them to really share how they feel and not, because my gut might be saying this, and they may know what my gut says. I want them to challenge that and say, well, I know what your gut says this, but have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Because in, in many organizations, and sometimes people are re reluctant to do that, I want to learn. I want to be challenged. I'm open to this because I don't have all the ideas. I, I want to hear um, other great ideas. At the end of the day, I've got to make the call, and sometimes it's that way, and sometimes it's with the, uh, the gut. Every situation is different. Hi, uh, my name is Murdad. Uh, seen uh, BD be involved in shaping the, uh, uh, the landscape of Vancouver from sort of a physical perspective and, you know, 
I think Vancouver is kind of coming up as, as, as a city that, that is getting involved more and more in, in beautiful architecture and in, in sort of uh, <coughs> having these landmark buildings. What gets you excited about the next five years, the next 10 years? Um, trying to figure out if, if, if BD's got these sort of massive plans like uh, you have in Station Squares and, and, yeah. and things like that. Thank you, yeah, yeah thanks. Um, you know, it, it's a, such an interesting transition because I grew up doing you know, industrial and I love industrial because you know, I know it really well and, and the residential side is again relatively new to us but we've been very fortunate and have had some very good success because we brought in the right people and leveraged our name. Um, I don't see us being in the next five, ten years being some preeminent residential developer. This city is blessed with an incredible uh, group of, of developers who, uh, who do so much for the uh, community and build fantastic buildings. But it is an ambition of ours to uh, continue to advance in that space. And Station Square is a great example. Um, we're going to be going in for approvals in the next three months on our, our final two towers, one of which is um, using a, an incredible architect out of New York and this will be like the most iconic residential building in Burnaby because we had such success with Station Square. We're thinking, why not push the envelope a little bit and try something, you know, and, and, you know, and if someone lead, you know, we have the confidence there to lead. We've got an amazing project. I th that's really exciting, you know, for us, uh, uh, for me as, as an organization to start doing, um, you know, uh, buildings like that. But again, I, I don't see us being like the, Ian Gillespie does an amazing job of these things and he's really impacting Vancouver. So I don't see us getting to that place even in the next five, ten years, maybe down, uh, down the road. But we want to continue to build quality buildings, nice design, happy, uh, happy clients and, and continue with what's got us um, this far. But I'm, I'm really excited about Station Square and looking ahead, we own um, an 80 acre site in Coquitlam that we rezoned 10 years ago to a multi-family mixed use residential um, site and we haven't launched it yet because the market had some changes in it and we need to go back and revisit the development plan but we're hoping within the next year to resolve those issues and if we could get that launched in the next five years, you're building almost a little town with like 3,200, 3,500 units um, bringing on which could be relatively affordable uh, housing. It's really important that this affordability issue gets talked about non-stop and of course it's real but I really don't like how the media keeps focusing on Vancouver and some expensive house in the city of, of Vancouver. I mean I grew up in Burnaby. I never thought about living in Vancouver. We lived in Port Moody for six years. Like the, I couldn't afford to live in Vancouver. It, this affordability issue needs to be looked at on a regional basis and what is a single mother in Surrey with two kids can she afford a townhouse? That's the affordability issue versus whether a house is three million or four million in the city. Who cares? Like that's that's not relevant. And price, you know, all this money's coming in. That's making a lot of people wealthier. Price creates a, a signal to the market, and there's a supply response. So cities have an obligation, and overall, to densify. I know neighborhoods sometimes get upset. Someone has to speak for that first-time buyer. The person's not in the market yet. So I'm excited about things we can do, Fraser Mills, to increase the supply, hopefully, of affordable housing to benefit the community. I'll let the media know about that message. Right? No, no, no. I've told them. They don't that listen. Line. And sells papers, right? Yeah. Oh, look at this derelict house and it's $8 million. Look, what does that have to do with anything? You got them fired up. Good no, question. Sorry. Good question. We've got one back corner. Hi, Ryan. My name is uh, Rod Tavener. Ryan, I, uh, as a, as a, as maybe the beginning of a family business that I currently own. Um, I'm interested having kids that are now, one is actually going to attend the School of Business. What was the focus and the role, you know, I'm interested in the humbleness of accepting a family business. You know, you step in, every, every child that comes into a family business sort of assumes and accepts that, particularly the successful ones, um, that you have to be humble to where it came from. But there's a role and a challenge for you to humbly take that and go to the next level. Yeah. And so I, I have never experienced that as, a, as I started my business. And um, now I find myself going, how far do I push and how far do I step back as I teach and guide the people in my current management group and my children that will eventually make their way into the business, 
How did you take that transition on and, and where did you put your stamp? And I know that every single person, and I know a lot of guys who are you know, successful and, and like yourself who, who are too humble and say that, no, no, you know, I didn't do much, I carried the torch. It's not true. It's guys like you um, who are, are, have taken it and taken it to the next level. How do you tell us here in this room without, uh, um, without sort of being too humble how you did it? What was it? I love the hunger speech. I love the entrepreneurial speech. I love it. And so don't sell it short. Thank you. Um, well, there's a lot. There's a lot to that. Um, I, I think, you know, um, entering the business, actually, after I left SFU, I was going to be a chartered accountant and then come back. I knew I'd end up in the business at some point, and I made a decision that, you know, at the time my dad, who was going to be 90 in June, he was, you know, he was at that time like 65, wasn't in the, I, I was worried about his sort of longevity. My brother was already in the business, so I thought, you know, I'm going to go in sooner. So I did my MBA at UBC and I joined the, I joined the company. I think I, I brought a lot of energy, uh, youthful energy and excitement. I looked at the model that my dad had created and the structure, this vertically integrated development company. Like, this is outstanding. Let's take this and scale it. The space was created for me, and I've taken that, I've used that kind of model in this hand. It's amazing that my dad did that, by the way. Self made a successful person, having this entity that he loves so much to relinquish that control. A lot of other people I know in business, they can't do it, they won't do it, and it's a disservice to the business. So in fact, him letting go like that allowed the company to go like this, and it may be a, an issue one day that I'm going to face, but I've tried to take that and apply it to our senior team. And Todd Ewan, who uh, is president of the industrial division, he has my full authority to do basically anything. He'll come to me on all sorts of things, and we'll talk, bounce back and forth. But he's given tons of latitude and to run the business like, like it's his own. And that goes across the board. I'm not, not a micromanaging person. I'm not a detailed person. And you've got to let them go. And I think so. I, I learned that from my dad, and we've applied it um, throughout the organization. And so it's a co combination of factors. But thank you. I appreciate your, your kind words. Well, the vision continues. I can't wait to see what happens in three years when you turn 50, sir. <laughs> Your impact has been immense. The insight tonight's been extremely valuable. Uh, on behalf of the group, if we could, let's thank Ryan Beatty for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.